Thank you so much for joining us tonight for this panel uh, at Opera Gallery. This is our exhibit, Muses, the City and the Artist, uh, which opened last Tuesday. Um, with this show, we really wanted to celebrate the complex symbiotic relationship between New York City and the artist community from the past, present, and future. We're thrilled to have Sean Corcoran, Senior Curator of Prints and Photographs from the Museum of City of New York. Melissa Reclef Burt, a clinical professor in the Visual Arts Administration at NYU, who in 2017 curated the show Inventing Downtown, artist-run galleries in New York City, 1952 to 1965, for NYU's Gray Art Gallery. Michael Lorenzini, um, archivist and photographer, as well as the curator of photography at the New York City Municipal Archives, and former editor of Aperture Magazine. And of course, our moderator, who many of you probably know, um, the great cultural critic, writer, curator, and true New Yorker, Carlo McCormick, uh, whose knowledge of this city's art history seems to know no bounds. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Carlo. Thanks, and uh, <laughs> thanks to everyone who uh, came out, and Kathleen, everyone at Opera, it's been really fun like when you work with a gallery that has kind of deep inventory and you can be like, oh, let's riff on New York. So it was really fun. Uh, how's that doing over there? We Too much feedback? Let me know if I sound like Hendrix at any point. Anyway, uh, I'm up here with people who have real chops, like scholarship and academic chops. I'm sort of a dilettante instead, like an amateur. So I'll be like the local color, but uh, don't, you know, I need too much fact checking, like, but you can take notes on anything they say because they all really know what they're talking about. Um, but then, then I thought I'd ask them something a little outside of the comfort zone, which is like, because it, I was really attracted. Let me keep this as far away from me. It's a small room, right? You can hear me? Okay. So I was really attracted to the notion of this show. It's like, because New York is kind of this incredible muse and so many great artists have taken so much from it. But then maybe it's just we're really delusional in New York. And, and I wonder, so I was kind of going like, well, is this work really particularly New York? I mean, so I had kind of asked you all, like, if you could take a peek at the show and tell me, like, if you see a work that, like, you can, like, look at it and go, like, or, or the, a work or an artist even in the show. So I can be like, yeah, they're like, that's so New York. Or is that, like, just a specious kind of provincialism? You want to go first? I, I know you're a good book for this. All right. Um, yeah, I, I mean, that's an interesting question. But I, it's funny. I, I think that artists come to New York for different reasons. You know, like there's been a lot of art movements that were specific to different locales because people would go there to paint a specific landscape or, you know, get some, uh, you know, that they were, they were looking for some particular scenery or something like that. In New York, I don't think that a lot of people move to New York because I want to paint New York or I want to, you know, maybe in photography, I think that, you know, there are people who, who want to photograph the excitement of the city. But I, I think more people come to New York because it's, um, you know, it's, it's the Big Apple, as a jazz musician said. It's, and um, I, you, you had this great line, which I wrote down because I knew I was going to forget it. But in the, uh, in the. I in, love it when they quote me. <laughs> <laughs> that you said that there's a, a myth of strife and sacrifice, you know, like in, of, of coming to in, in New York. And, and, I, and I said, yeah, that, that's kind of what it's about. It's kind of like that like we are Spartans, you know, kind of attitude that, you know, we, we come here, people will come here and do art here, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. You're gonna have competition, you're gonna have, you're gonna get, be pushed to, to you know, achieve more. Um, anyway, that's my thought of the day. That was a specific question, but you can take it as far as little as he did. <laughs> oh, okay, so um, before, uh, on my way here, because um, Carlo asked me to come at the last minute, so all of a sudden I'm starting to get a little nervous. 
Um, and so I, when I get nervous, I listen to a podcast. So I, I was listening to David Byrne being interviewed by Terry Gross. And he was uh, talking about, um, uh, I guess it's the 40th of, I can't even believe it, anniversary of Stop Making Sense, the... Um, Jonathan Sense. Right. And so listening to him and, and, and listening to, you know, all the concepts that were going into the songs and the non sequiturs and learning French so he could just say, like, really pretentious things in French and Psycho Killer and... Um, and, and just his absolute like love of making something um, and, and the idea of trying to make things that he didn't see before or hear before, you know, that was like the whole goal of, of his band was to like do something different. And when I went into then transition into this exhibition, the first thing I thought is that every single artwork is so distinct. You know, this isn't a show about like, you know, one style or one statement. And so it seems to me that a really important characteristic of New York um, is its independence and the way in which it really, I mean, there is collaboration, of course, but it really does foster, especially the artists of this generation. I mean, it's later work, but many of the artists really kind of came here in, in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. And it was a moment where that was really a predominating sensibility of, you know, what is it you're going to do? What is it you're going to say? And how can you say something that the generation before you wasn't saying? Um, so that's what really struck me. It's like a lot of like individuals, you know, yeah, talking at you. Modernism and novelty as well, which New York is kind of addicted to, like fashion and street does that too. Yes. Uh, Sean's just getting over cold, so he sounds like yeah. So, sorry, I'm a little hoarse. Um, okay, well, I'll answer your question, um, but I, then I'm gonna uh, then I'll add on to that. I think like maybe the two people in the popular mind that are most associated with New York City are probably Keith Haring and Andy Warhol both of which are not native New Yorkers. I mean, there are certainly plenty of great born and bred New Yorkers, but I think that is something that New York attracts the ambitious, the hungry. It attracts um, people maybe looking for something like of like of people of like mind, but not necessarily exactly the like. like well, no one wants to be a copycat of doesn't. No one comes here to be a copycat of somebody else, you know. Um, and I, so I was like, um, I, my little homework was like to think of. Yeah, this is what, so what key, museum people do, <laughs> right? It's like I was like I I like sat at my desk at late afternoon and was like, oh, uh, what kind of what twentieth century movements. Um, do I think do I think of when I think of New York? I'm just gonna can I rattle through them quick? So I was thinking of like the Village Bohemians and the begin at the turn of the century and um, and I was thinking also like it's not just visual artists that come to the city; it's all kinds of artists. So I was thinking of like okay, so let's say the Village Bohemians is like and then John Sloan and Reginald Marsh and the Ashcan School, Everett Shin. But then I'm a photography person, so. Um, Bernice Abbott, um, but then also writers, Juna Barnes, out of Vincent Millay. Like, that's the other thing. It's like, pa usually painters or photographers or visual artists aren't in a vacuum. They're in a cultural milieu, and there are people working in all these other areas that feed their, their brain and their energy and... Um, you know, you think of the New York School, and I, I, I think it's of poets and yeah, I think of like Demby and you know, Frank O'Hara, and you know, like Rudy Burkhart, who's somebody who's a photographer, a filmmaker, a painter. You know, um, so that's that. I don't know. That's just like uh, so. Then the other ones was early was Alfred Stieglitz's circle, photographers and painters. Um, you know, Abex New York School. I mentioned. Uh, the photo league and and the the there was a New York photo school which was like Robert Frank and William Klein and people like that um, pop artists picture generations artists which 
uh, many of these schools are actually represented in the show in one form or another. The East Village scene, of course, and graffiti and street art. So, anyways, I, I, I you know also because of the crossover and the richness, I'd add the Harlem Renaissance because yeah, that, of course, that had like a you know a, a real rich tapestry of. I mean, it's, our artists are really careful around each other. They love each other, but like they do steal shit all the time in terms of ideas. So artists are you know really, visual artists are really comfortable hanging out with like musicians, filmmakers, designers, poets, you know, things like that, because it gets a little tricky when two painters hang out and, you know, like, who, who came up with that idea first? That's just an old art art story, but. So I don't know, uh, I don't know what New York looks like, but uh, Melissa, when I was talking to you early this morning, and I'm going like, oh, but, you know, can, can you please, and we just don't get a chance to hang out, so that's why she said yes. Um, but, uh, but I was thinking of, because I mentioned to you uh, how much I loved uh, uh, Rudy Burkhart's wife and, and you know uh, the Loft Generation, this amazing book, and, and she's such a great writer. And this is this woman who just experienced it's, it's a great breadth of history she lived, and she kind of has this story of like Bill de Kooning like walking down the streets in the late '40s, early '50s, and he's like loving like the candy wrappers and the smushed gum and the dog poo and the cracks and the grime and he's looking at it like and you go like oh yeah you know that, that kind of shit looks like abstract expressionism but you know basically she's saying you know that if you're pushing paint around and, and battling with it like that generation was it was like a they were wrestling with paint and representation on the edge of abstraction and and then expressionism you know and control or whatever all the ways they were wrestling with that stuff that, that that you would look at everything that way but then it made me think about like the skin of the city which i don't really always you know we think of the glitz or whatever but there is this kind of surface of the city that kind of bleeds through. You know, the city just keeps changing, particularly um, Manhattan, but now Brooklyn, you know, um, and Long Island City. I, I literally have to use my um, Siri <laughs> because no landmark uh, that I'm, I remember from, from that neighborhood exists anymore. It's like a completely d different place. Um, and so when you're doing research and doing archival research to really try to understand the artist's relationship to place, which is also, you know, the, the wonderful book on um, Quantus Slip, the, um, the, the way in which place and work could come together, even if it's not like a literal coming together, you know, those places are gone. Um, and so there's also this incredible importance to those deep dive research in, in the kind of archives that you have um, because uh, you're, you, you know, sometimes you can go to the street, right, and try to picture, oh yeah, they were here, this is where they lived. But sometimes what happens like when a street doesn't exist anymore? Like for this artist I'm researching, Lewis Street, she lived on, I have the address, and then I'm like, Lewis Street, Lewis Street. And it was this horrible feeling in an archive an, an archive, by the way, that wasn't even in New York, because I'm like, I've never heard of Lewis Street. I've lived in New York for like 40 years. I've never heard of Lewis Street. And then you do the research, and it's like, well, the housing projects that went in on the Lower East Side got rid of a whole bunch of streets. Right. Okay. And I'm like, wow, I'm researching an obscure artist who lived on a street in New York that no longer exists. Like, maybe this is a sign to stop what I'm doing, you know? Um, but anyway. So the way in which you can try to bring archives and texture back to try to, you know, bring more than just the object, but kind of bring the object in its context is, is um, I think, part of something that maybe all of us think about. And both of you guys have worked at institutions which very much allowed people to kind of access their place and time. I think that, like, uh, the municipal archives, they have this thing where all, every, almost every property, at least in Manhattan, I'm sorry, I'm not very good about the other all boroughs, the all the boroughs, uh, we, gets photographed at one point or another for, by the tax people, just to, you know, for tax records. 1940, 1940 was a uh, WPA sponsored there we go. project to photograph every building in the five boroughs, and then they redid it in the mid 80s. And those are gr two great times to capture the city because. <laughs> 
uh, 40s, you're coming right, you're coming right out of the Great Depression. Um, but the city hasn't really changed that much. You don't have the the big, um, you know, it's really it's 1950 that the city starts doing these sort of massive, you know, there had been some projects earlier, but like these massive like slum clearance projects of Robert Moses mm. and, and really just wiping out huge swaths of the city. And then in the 80s, it's this, they capture the city at one of its lowest points, but it's before all the new, um, you know, all the new, Projects came, you know, you know, yeah. building came in and really transformed things. No, but it's fun. I mean, I did my building. I live on that. And then, as I remember, like, <laughs> I smoke weed, so I get shit wrong all the time. But uh, <laughs> as I remember, the Museum of the City of New York did something where it was like you did a whole thing about the kind of the invention of the grid. Were you there? Oh then? yeah, yeah, we yeah, did. You were there. Yeah, we did an exhibition called the Greatest Grid. And was... and and it was, so it was like basically, but you could go there and you could. You could kind of find your place, and then you find out, like, oh, yeah, that's when it was farmland. That's when the grid came in. Right. Like, for me, it was, like, really interesting because where I live is, like, a little last bit of uh, – I'm in the Lower East Side, and it's uh, – or the East Village area, uh, and um, a lot of it's landfill. Landfill, yeah. Yeah, so this was all, like, swampland. So when things like Sandy come through and the whole neighborhood gets destroyed, I find out that – the north side of my street's fucked, but where I am on the south side of the street, I'm on bedrock. Wow. And it's like this weird thing. It's like, it's not like one, it's not like I'm king of the hill and they're down there. It's like it's, like it's a level street, but it affects stuff. Yeah. 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 So, well, I mean, yeah. uh, let's talk about place affecting things like. Your, your heyday, the East Village scene, right? Like, mm. what was New York like then and how did it affect the work that was being made. Like, I mean, I, I, I'm going to be the moderator and I'm going to ask yeah, you yeah, because yeah, this yeah, is yeah. your subject yeah. more than it is mine. No, I, and I do remember that. Uh, one thing that, uh, that struck me is that uh, my neighborhood, the Lower East Side, was uh, the, the place of immigrants. It's where all the poor people from yeah. basically every, every wave of immigrant we had, they all kind of ended up in... And that's like where if you want to go to the Tenement Museum, they tell the story better than I do. But the funny thing was that, like, that history was still really residual and really there. So you had, like, uh, a whole lot of that culture. But because of that, everyone was trying to get out. It was affordable, yeah. right? But these things also affect size. So, like, when you think of Soho and it's great, glory days and you can think of like Tribeca's had like you know yeah. it, it, it had a moment after Soho and stuff it's not just that looking for cheap places they're looking for as much space as possible yeah. okay. when you get by the time you get to the East Village thing you're dealing with like ratty little tenements mm -hmm. and everyone's work it's really small and you know like so I'm trying to think Keith in this show is very much like that and Kenny Scharf those would be two like quintessential East Village kind of artists in that time. And if you look at their work at that time, it's domestic scale. I want, I want to talk about real estate for a minute. Oh, please. Yeah. <laughs> Always such fun. yeah, no, but I, um, yeah, so um, if, if you pick up Prudence's book, she'll, she explains this much better than me, but, but you know, the Coenzy slip, why that, that little art scene happened was because you had all these sale maker lofts that were, that were, you know, this was a now, forgotten technology, right? And so they were available because nobody really knew what to do with that space yet. Um, the redevelopment of Lower Manhattan really hadn't happened yet, so you, you had these available spaces. Um, so you had this weird, uh, it's like a, a pocket between uses for, the, for that, that neighborhood and the artists slip in. And then, and then Soho was, was very much the same way right. because it was slated for demolition um, for decades because Robert Moses and even going back before him, they wanted to Bird build Street the Lower Manhattan Expressway right through Soho. So all the buildings were potentially slated for demolition, so nobody invested in the neighborhood. And it was this really rundown. Moses described it as the, the one of the worst slums in, in Manhattan. Um, you know, Hell's yeah, they call it the mm -hmm. fire department called it Hell's Hundred Acres because there would be so many fires there and these old buildings with no fire protection. And and so nobody wanted to live there. Nobody wanted to invest there. 
And so artists started to move in and illegally live there and, and, and do work. But it wasn't really until 64 where when Jane Jacobs and other, other activists really shut down Moses that they're like, okay, hey, maybe we can actually start building a scene here. But the weird thing is, is that even after Moses was blocked, and he was really pretty much out of power after that. It stayed uh, until 69. It still stayed as a project that mayors kept discussing because it was going to bring jobs to New York. But there's that, there's that still was all they cared about. even but there still was redevelopment in that area anyway around yeah. Pace and the Br Brooklyn Bridge yeah. approaches. Yeah. Right. So I think the artist and residency law is 69 or yeah. 70 something like yeah. So, but, right around then. Yeah. 61 actually was when they first started. It was actually when they start, first started uh, putting signs on buildings that said AIR, which meant artists and resident. And that was for the fire department, yeah. really, more than anything. So there'd be fires and be like, oh no, there's people who live. Yeah, yeah. like, because you think, like, you can't who, just who let would live in down. this? Like, you know, horrible. Yeah. When you interview them, they talk about having to hide you know, the, the beds and the, you know, like there was like a place to hide all that. So it did. So when they said artists in residence, they didn't mean, and we sleep here and we cook here. Right. Um, it just really meant we're using this for a studio purpose. And, and actually a lot of artists, I also subsequently found out uh, maybe less in Soho, but more in, I guess we call it NoHo now and Broadway. Um, some of those buildings, a lot of artists did just use them for studio space and had apartments. The, um, you know, that they would go to. Uh, yeah. to yeah, the Herring actually had that in Fort Keys. Um, I just was curious, you guys, because you guys are really uh, uh, photo uh, kind of uh, smart people that way. Uh, Danny Lyons did that destruction of... That's can you, where, can you that's talk where, about that? That's again? where I was heading was... I, and so the whole reason Danny Lyon did this epic work called The Destruction of Lower Manhattan was because... He stayed at Mark de Souvreau's place in the seaport area, and he had just come back from his um, Freedom Riders civil rights movement work, and he needed to decompress, so he was staying with Mark. And all around him, all the buildings were going down for the redevelopment of the Brooklyn Bridge approaches and the redevelopment of Pace. Um, and he just started going out with his camera and taking taking pictures of, and eventually he made friends with the workers, so he went up into the buildings, because back then they were literally taking it down floor by floor with sledgehammers. And it's if you don't know the, the, the work, it's, it's amazing. It's there is this weird thing, because so much of what has been romanticized about New York has been its decrepitude. Like even when we talk about like the, the New York school, the abstract yeah. expression is that they're coming into, they're you know, largely European immigrants and stuff like that. They're coming into a city that's basically bu busted, right? It's like never really recovered from the depression. And then I'm like, my history is very much a coming to a place that's really run down as well. And that there was a lot of mythology around that between the the late 40s and the late 70s when I could so I'm already inheriting 30 years of of mythology about that so does New York how do we perpetrate that mythology I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll make another connection for you is like Gordon Matta Clark obsessively photographed graffiti drains yeah. and the, right when the emergence of a street writing culture was happening in the 70s which we could have a whole longer discussion about you know why what, what graffiti writing meant to, in, to youth in, in New York in the 1970s and what it's done since. But certainly Keith and Kenny are, you know, a part, a part of that uh, tree. Right. Uh, but 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 then again, like, there, there you go. There's South Bronx is another one of these pockets where yeah. we're um, created through the you know, the Cross Bronx Expressway are completely ruining a neighborhood, and then you have all these abandoned buildings, and it becomes this place of, like, what do we, you know, people start writing on those buildings because... What else have we got to do? Nobody else cares, right? And yeah. and and so, again, that's another one of the, those pockets. Um, you know, and, um, and... But it also becomes a place of creativity with yeah. a place like Fashion Moda yeah. and... and 
and then you even have downtown artists yep. going uptown. And and the birth of hip hop and, and, and all, all the stuff. We did have bad neighborhoods, but I, I don't want anyone to to uh, get the wrong impression. The whole city sucked. <laughs> I mean, so like, you know, on that map there, we got Max's Kansas City, this legendary place. But even, even through all of that, I was going to say, is that there was always this commitment within the city to support the arts, you know, and that um, um, e even actually the, the first... Let's disagree, huh? Well, all right, but <laughs> but the, the, let him go another minute. Okay, <laughs> but the but but believe it or not, the first the first loft law was, for artists was 1929, where that which was the peak of loft construction in New York City. But already uh, businesses were moving to the south because they were uh, uh, southern politicians were saying, hey, you know, we don't have any of those pesky labor laws down here, or you know, mm -hmm. socialist, you know, come down here, and you know, you're labor is going to be much much better so there was already this sense of like oh man we've, we've overbuilt and so they you know they said oh well, we could start you artists could start using these spaces so so that goes back to that and then 68 is the the other the the first uh soho loft law but it also encompasses tribeca and parts of williamsburg you know and then 71 is actually is when Lindsay first you could become a certified artist. But there's always been these programs, the Percent for Art and all these other programs that were really trying to put public money towards towards artists. And weirdly, and 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 one of the things um, yeah, Prudence talks about in her book is is one Chase Plaza going up downtown and you know, people start buying these massive artworks for their big lobbies, and they're looking down at the artists living in these little lofts who are, are making the art and going, oh yeah, they live right down there. But that that whole post-World War II international style, which, in, you know, we kind of think in some ways like very sort of cold and well, destructive. Which is what Gordon Maddox Clark was right. fighting. Right, but, but weirdly, and a lot of the artists in the show benefited from that because what did they have to do for that you know, in order to go higher, they had to have a public plaza to to like get the air rights. When and so then you get a Calder sculpture there. I think your impulse to say like the city is not friendly to artists is is more like free market um, invasion of money into places artists live um, and push the artists out and create well, you know, affordable spaces. I yeah, think the, of it. I, let me explain how I think of it because uh, growing up, like the whole. The narr part of the big narrative of New York was what kept us going. Our financial engine was Wall Street and, and that little uh, whatever uh, bloodbath of greed that was going on there. And then people started doing research in it. And they, you know, this, someone wrote a book called The Warhol Economy, where they basically said, like, you know, if you put the art world like there, and then you you know, got that literary kind of scene, we got a lot of a lot of film and post production here. We got a huge fashion industry. That this is actually a much bigger economy than anyone will ever give credit for, and it's actually what the city lives on. I've always thought that like New York's really underestimated its cultural capital. One of the things that we're, we're just saying artists, but I, you know, just from you know my research, women artists, non-white artists, it, you know, it wasn't like there were all these museums and galleries like, oh please, we want to see what you're producing. Um, the doors were really shut, and some women figured it out quicker, um, and and some folks figured it out quicker, but I mean, just from my own background, as you, you know, you know where I come from, um, but the, there, there just wasn't the space, um, and so for a lot of artists, they, you know, didn't, they weren't able to sustain a career, and they weren't able to afford to stay here, and I love that um, part of your essay where you bring in Clement Greenberg, where he's like, if you're not in New York, your work doesn't matter. And I think that for um, a lot of artists, and um, I don't know if you've heard of Frederick Brown, um, but his son Bentley Brown is doing a lot of work on the Worcester Street loft that his father, a painter, had that was like this kind of gathering point, you know, around Ornette Coleman and a whole jazz scene and, and a lot of other artists. You know, his father never got a retrospective in New York. 
and um, and 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 so he ended up, for health reasons, having to leave the city, and you know left behind this whole legacy of brilliant paintings that no one could see because he wasn't white. And so I also think that you know in all this talk, when we say artists, we also in the art world, and we congratulate ourselves about how wonderful we are. We also have to also take take into consideration our own. Um, our own our own biases and the biases within our history. So when I go to a show like this and then I see, you know, McLean Thomas and and then you see the you know the work of Nikki de Saint Fall, you know, just kind of there, you know, um, part of it sparkling, the most sparkling work you could see, and and I think it's very very powerful because um, for a lot of those artists. You know the doors weren't open, and and so that's something else I really love uh, yeah, about the show. Yeah, <laughs> that, no, that's not just a good point. It's actually a good point of departure, because if, if what we love about New York is the kind of stories we tell to, that make us New Yorkers, so like you know, it's it's this shared uh, narrative we have. It's like that narrative. And when you did that show, inventing downtown, you told a lot of stories. We can always tell the story with the same 20 famous artists who all happen to be like white and male and things like that. But like the conversation got really interesting of late. And, and you did that. And Sean, like, okay, so uh, the museum uh, Sean works at is turning 100 years old. I know he doesn't look that old, but that, that's how old they are. And so. I just remember because it's on the imprint of your email, and it's like you know that that a hundred years of telling stories is that is something like that. Yeah, it's very yeah. Disney esque. Yeah. Um, but uh, what are the stories we tell right now, and how how have those stories changed, and how can we make them better, or whatever? To, to all of you. I mean, that's something we we <clears throat> think about and struggle over. I mean, right now we're. We have a new director and we're looking at the calendar for the next several years and like it's where everybody is really taking a hard look and saying like what is it that we what is it what are the stories that we should be telling about because I, I will say like a lot of people tend to think we're interested in the changing built environment of the city when in fact Really, we're we're most interested in the people who make the city what it is, and 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 placing them within the context of the urban environment. And so, so the changing look of the city is uh, is certainly an important part of it. But it's really the stories of the diversity of the city and the different points of view and perspectives. So, what, what is, um, you you know you're the archives for the city. Yeah. So. You're kind of the guardians of, of the, and what sort of blind spots and what sort of uh, uh, things are you are you addressing on an institutional level? I mean, we're full of blind spots, you know, okay. because well, no, but just because our collecting mission is is to collect the records of the city government of New York, so so you know you're always looking at things from that perspective. Um, and we did, they did. We have recently started a thing called neighborhood stories, where we we do encourage um, um, people to tell sto like stories from the perspective of the people interacting with government policies to 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 um, um, get their side of the of the story. But um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's one of those things you you always have to think. Um, um, in, in the archives world, and I always tell my uh, my students I teach a class on preservation and one of the things I always say is that is that um, archiving is political what what stories you decide to keep become history and so it just just by the mere fact of keeping one thing and not keeping another thing is a political act and you always should be aware of that when you're talking to your students right like how you how you teaching them not history but like our duty to history, like uh, how how do you how do you inform them that? Um, well, you know, my students are international, so what I had to learn was, I mean, they wanted to come to New York, and and they definitely have a lot of 
fantasy projection onto what they think New York is. But what I've learned from them is the, you know, the, the sort of international part of the city, um, the way in which, you know, the city could also be, you know, what some critics call the third space. Like you're neither, I mean, I'm very much in this space because this is, you know, I've been here forever and I grew up right, you know, like you, right around the corner from here. Um, so, but for a lot of my students, you know, they're, they come from other cultures, other countries, speak other languages, think in other languages, and then come here and think in English or, or you know, and it's like they're in another space and another consciousness. And so we've been working on projects where we talk about third space, and I recently sent them to PS1 to see the Rick Ritt, um Tiravania show, and I'm like, all right, talk about third space. You know, there's this amazing space, PS1, that was once a school, but now it's a gallery. So, you know, how is how is your subjectivity around that space different? And then what kind of work is this artist doing, this artist who's from literally everywhere? Um, and, and so they did this great project about Pad Thai and how the recipe itself is actually, it's part Thailand, but it's also part China. And there's some, you know, it's like from all over the world, part South America. Um, and so I realized that from my students, that so much of what's changing about New York and my own relationship to New York is the way in which New York is so international and there's so many different subjectivities. And if you just kind of open yourself to it, you can kind of see the city and relate to space and relate to place and relate to art um, in this whole other way. You know, this idea of New York as this, you know, melting pot or mixing you know, is is just ingrained in the city too. It's, it's. Um, I recently had an opportunity to look at a, a document, and it's um, it's, it was written by uh, James, the Duke of York, for which New York is named after, to uh, the second English governor of New York, which he took over after the Dutch. Did you say she? No, I said oh, he. he okay. uh, after, sorry, yeah, yeah, no, after the, sorry. After the after the Dutch briefly retook uh, New York uh, during the Third Eng English Dutch War, they they um, they were sending a second governor to take over, and he wrote him this letter about all the territory he was giving him, which would basically went from Long Island to you know Maine, and he said, "You've got this. There's this one piece of this whole." land here which is this little colony at the you know tip of, of of this island here they're a bit different than the other english colonies you're going to be dealing with you know they do things a little differently there they're this weird mix of cultures and they've just recently been in open rebellion against us but don't punish them let them do their thing we don't quite get it but somehow it works it, it functions and, and that's always been this weird thing that people recognize about New York, I think, is that how can this mix of people speaking different languages somehow function? <laughs> but yeah, we like, do. Like when I travel, I, I tell people, like, no, no, I'm not from the United States. I'm from a little island, like Manhattan, <laughs> as, as, a, as a, an office would call it, a little island off the coast. But uh, I thought, like, this, maybe we should open it up to, yeah, please go ahead, man. about all these different phases that New York City has gone through up until the 1980s. And now, how do you see, actually see New York today with all the gentrification? It looks like a city, many other cities in, in the United States can claim themselves to be international. Has, in fact, New York City lost some of that draw that drew a lot of people to come to New York for a reason, whether it be in the uh, arts of uh, decorative arts or, or, or music or, and what have you. I, you know, I look at like Miami, for, for example, and I, I, I just see New York has sort of lost that thing that it had. At, uh, and, you know, I don't see anything current. Oh, Go to Ridgewood. That's my yeah. answer. Yeah, no, yeah. you know, as far as I can tell, the kids are still really having fun. Yeah. It's just <laughs> not in Manhattan. <laughs> but is there, I mean, do you see any ways, in, I guess in particular, I mean, you know, you know, graffiti art, it was sort of a thing, right, when it was illegal, you know, it was down on the train, now it's sort of become mainstream. 
Yeah. It's yeah. still really illegal. Yeah, r rich, you know, uh, or whatever. Uh, the, the, there's a lot of uh, placemaking is actually the real estate term. It, like if you study real estate, you really get an idea of like how evil things are. Okay. But placemaking is like it's different than gentrification. It's sort of like let's just eradicate what was here and build a fake community around it. Like and it's big, big developments. And what they do is they do hire people to kind of do street art murals. But that's really different than graffiti, where kids are still being put in jail for this stuff. It's kind of. I guess my question is: Do you see today New York as as, as having something that it, it had, you know, that it can sort of claim it, it, its own as opposed to any other city? I mean, whether you know, hip hop, New York, right? Uh, New York, East Harry, you know. Well, I, I would I would say that like even with those things that it it took at least a decade before anybody recognized that those were a thing, you know. First hip hop party is 1973. No, you know most of the world hadn't heard about it until 1983. So you know there's going to be things going on right now that maybe we're cool enough still to hear about, but. But to say that, that, that that's going to be the next big thing, I don't, I don't know. What I can tell you that hasn't changed is that, like, no matter when you're here or when you got here, you kind of just missed it. Right. <laughs> like, it was so much better, like, 10 minutes ago. So, you know, like, uh, for, uh, there's a lot of nostalgia over a really rotten time when I was living here, yeah. you know, and... Uh, it, and whatever everyone did, you know, it's really glamorized and stuff. But the fact is, for most of us, it's like we missed Jimi Hendrix or we missed like mm -hmm. something, you know, we'd miss the 60s here. Yeah. So I think that like you got to be a little careful with because yeah. this town chokes on nostalgia. We're good. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you.